Can you please, 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 please just take a second to hit that subscribe button down below? The reason for that is because I have just started this channel. I am a DJ who had a career in Key West for 10 years, 10 successful years as a career DJ. 20 years altogether, I started when I was 13 years old. Um, and I went from a full-time DJ to a full-time not DJ. And so I took up content creating instead where I'm making videos just showing the beauty of the world and what we do to uh, overcome challenges and show community participation and mental health awareness and all these great things, one human family. And for me to continue this, it costs money. And I would love it if all you did was just hit that subscribe button, which once I get to a certain amount, I need a thousand people right now to subscribe. I can start monetizing these videos and all you have to do is click. That is it. Please, please, please. And then once I get to a million, I will stop asking for you to subscribe. So please subscribe. Three, two, one. Do it, please. Do it. Do it. Do it now, please. So I lift my hands to the God that guides me, to the one that finds me. Even in my darkest days, he walks beside me singing songs of freedom, always singing songs of life. And they're leading me out of the darkness And they're bringing me into the light Hey, he never said it would be easy, no He never said we would be safe Because of the COVID-19 virus, I have zero gigs, so I decided to just build videos. I'm sorry, but Afro, you know, the carpenter legend, is really busy making lots of noise. And the old man is very stubborn and is not going to stop cutting wood just for me. So, you're going to hear this, uh, this carpenter every once in a while, but it's just part of the nature of uh, living life and making things happen. So, I want to introduce to you one of my favorite people in the entire universe. Adam, did you know that? I am very glad of that <laughs> introduction, actually, yes. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, what I have behind me is a very, very, very sentimental piece for not only myself, but Adam as well. And it is the one piece, as I'm leaving my house and moving all of my life into a van, I told Adam that I have to have this piece in my van. And he decided to let me do that. He decided to let me cut it up very respectfully so that I could still keep this piece in my van. And so before I cut it up, we are going to showcase this piece today on our Soulful Sunday. I want Adam to explain the beauty that is his creation that he made back in 2000, what, 2006, he said? So, so give, us uh, the, yeah, give us the entire backstory, the front story, and all of it all over the place story. Uh, this painting I made my senior year in um, college, in art school, at Bowling Green State, Univers State University School of Art. Um, of course, as a graduating senior, you have to produce your thesis show. 
Um, and this is a, a culmination of all the work that you've been putting together and not necessarily just, you know, the actual physical artworks, but it's the status of your artistic development as a professional. And so, you know, obviously being called a thesis, sh thesis show, there is some type of thesis or main idea that kind of runs through um, the, the body of work. And that indeed is the challenging part because, you know, while you're in school, you're also being trained as a technician, how to use a paintbrush properly, color theory, uh, you know, concepts about composition, um, just basic design elements. Uh, but to really take design and illustration and technique to the level of artistic expression, in some ways you kind of have to have something to say, right? You're using yourself and your acumen of technique and skill um, as a lightning rod to maybe touch on something that is a little bit more in my case, spooky, you know, it's a little bit something more uh, out there and kind of universal to us all. Yeah. Uh, so at that time, uh, this artwork, um, you know, I, I, I guess where I should start is my thesis was trying to make some identity for myself as an artist, being a young man in America. Um, I was really interested in, in highly traditional uh, techniques like portrait painting. Um, I'm really interested in landscape painting. And at the same time, and almost by contrast, I love, you know, hip hop and uh, graffiti and illicit arts and, you know, uh, wheat pasting, street culture, you know, all these things that kind of, in a way, ostensibly fly in the face of tradition. Um, and so that really became my thesis. And, you know, I guess I start this conversation uh, by, by building out that framework because, you know, as time has passed in these 15 years um, subsequent, my style has changed quite a bit. But um, this work kind of epitomized that period of my life and I really, really liked it. Um, it, was, it was a great time of discovery for me as an artist of course, probably most um, you know art school seniors will tell you that it's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, so this one in particular um, involves all of these different, seemingly disparate elements that I put together in you know the the thesis that ultimately is really aligned with what we call postmodernism or hip hop more colloquially. Um, you know, Americans when you say hip hop, a lot of people think oh the music. I'm not really talking about the music necessarily. I'm talking about the culture. Yeah. The culture of hip hop is the idea behind it, the thesis, if you will, is utilizing the vastness of all the records we have access to, especially in modern times, and mixing them in new ways to drive new meanings, to you know, build a unique uh, sentiment about them. And that's really where I was coming from with this show. So if I'm honest, I don't even remember what I called the show, but um, this, this artwork is purely that. Um, another thing that I was very much into at that time was uh, religious iconography, hence the halo behind the portrait. The portrait, of course, is um, my, my love of my life at that time and even now currently all these years later. Uh, this is my wife, Kelly, um, who at the time was simply my college girlfriend, you know. Um, Kelly, in this case, is carrying this kind of mysterious bucket. And, um, you know, this is just me reaching for symbols. And if I recall correctly, um, I loved to just put symbols together and then leave some room for the viewer, right? So she's carrying this bucket with this kind of mystical eye on it. You know what I mean? Again, getting back to some of my interests in ancient iconography, mystery, so on and so forth. Um, inside of Kelly's garment, there is this kind of mysterious tropical island, you know? Um, yeah. Showing some kind of distance and some depth to herself, some depth to her soul, maybe a depth to the soul of us all. Um, and, uh, you know, then she's surrounded by um, some kind of graffiti elements, some wheat pasted on trees to show with the idea that, you know, we all have branches and 
you know, are spreading in a very organic way. Uh, um, but, that's what that, so, so explain the whole tree part again, because you never explained that one to me. Yeah, you know, the, the tree is just, I think that the tree is a really profound um, symbol in, in any circumstance. You know, in this circumstance, it, it just really shows how, or what I was trying to show at that time, um, and the way I'm interpreting the work now, um, after all of these years, looking at it again, um, is it, it shows the, the fertility, you know, the spread, you know, the tree is constantly, in some ways, especially where I'm from, um, which is the middle of the country, and that's where I painted this painting, um, it shows the constant death and rebirth, you know what I mean? There is this real... Um, ancient theme with the tree, not to mention that they're just physically beautiful um, and impactful. So, you know, putting all of these things together, I didn't really have like this hardcore meaning that you're supposed to look at this painting and put the, the pieces together and figure it out. But strangely enough, for my own self, looking at this painting all these years later, um, you know, here's a painting of, you know, a divine moment of my own wife, who in some ways I, didn't know nearly as well as I know now. Um, she's holding this mystery bucket she's carrying, she's kind of offering it to you. And little did I know at this time that Kelly was actually pregnant with our first son when I painted this painting, but we didn't know yet. Um, you always that, give me every time you tell me that. I literally- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I can't look at this painting and, and not realize that that is really, you know, maybe um, there's some kind of yummy and collective consciousness thing. There's something else to happen into that now, my interpretation, I can see. But at the time, I really didn't know why I was putting this bucket other than to allow the mystery of whoever is looking at this painting. I'm looking at it now, you've looked at it. It's belonged to others in the past, but it's like, whoever looks at this painting, it's acknowledging the mystery in your life. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, of course, now here I talk to you from a tropical island far, far away from where I painted this painting. And even that is a um, motorcycle going by. Even that is indicated in the painting, which I think is kind of wild. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a mix of, you know, uh, a young painter's dreams and imaginations all intermix it a little bit of kind of that prophecy type of thing that we all hope we have about our own life, you know? Um, so, yeah. So, so that's kind of the backstory on that one, you know what I mean? Well, so, okay, so we got, we got the dress, we know it's Kelly, we know about the bucket, we know about the eye. Now tell me about the cat. Well, the cat, um, Kelly has a tattoo of a cat on her, on her shoulder. And one of the things that I love about cats, and they've been revered throughout history, anciency, as being highly, highly, highly perceptive of anything. Um, you know, even what we would kind of think of as non-tangibles, you know. Um, I am really quick to use the kind of terminology vibes, right? And it's like, I, I know that makes me sound like a hippie or an artist or... Beat well, Nickers. Dreadlocks used to rock. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, but here, here's the thing: is that um, you know, when you when you move into a room, if all the cats in the room scatter out the place, so there's a highly likelihood that, or a high likelihood that either a you scared them, or b there's something about your vibe that is, you know, the cat needs to take a little bit of distance from. And this has been rec recognized for a long time. And in ancient Egypt, they had these things called temple cats, where the temples were built with these really, really, obviously sturdy stone walls, and they were made with really precise geometries, but they would have these cats, you know, hanging out in there. And when the cats would be, as a collective, disrupted instantly, you know what I mean? The, the practitioners and the adepts inside would be able to realize that something has just changed. And I think that even, uh, you know, more, um, you know, we just, we recognize that in our own life. Have you ever walked into a room and you're like, ooh, holy shit, like something ain't right. Or, some, you know, on the other side, been in a room and someone walks in and you know there's trouble. Yeah. It's a real thing. And so, um, so here's our temple cat and, and the cat inside, if I'm not mistaken, it's been some years, but it says perception, yeah? That's kind of like near, I like this one of this parts is my favorite because I'm actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the arrows coming down, 
from, from the human figure. I mean, in this case, it's hard for me to look at this and not think about my wife, but it doesn't have to be my wife, right? It could be anyone. This is just a person who's yeah. giving off these vibes, who's, yeah. who's giving it off, you know? And um, the cat is there to uh, perceive that. Now, the kind of the graffiti um, sh word coming through um, says the word stray, S-T-R-A-Y. Um, and as I was telling you the other day on the phone, Scott, that, um, you, you know, when, when you write graffiti and you're into graffiti culture, usually you kind of pick one word, four to six letters somewhere there, and you just write that forever, you know. Um, and for a long, long time, I wrote the word stray. I subsequently later on, um, you know, probably even 10 years ago now, ended up picking a different word to write. But um, because the letters just flowed a little bit better. But for a long time, stray, I felt like was this kind of cool stray cat thing, you know what I mean? And, and it made its cameo in many of my paintings from that time, I can tell you. So, uh, so yeah, this painting, 15 years old, has mostly been owned by other people and not me, um, but it's a fun one. So what are you all doing to keep your sanity, keep, keep, your, uh, keep your spirits up during these strange mm -hmm. moments? Well, you know, it's an excellent question. Um, number one, I will say that, um, thankfully, my, my boys are, I don't want to say unbothered about it because that's dramatic, but um, they're cool. I wish I was more like them, you know? <laughs> They, they are at a, probably an ideal age to go through something like this in the sense that they're not driving cars and dying to get out with their friends, but at the same time, they're not toddlers either. They're very yep. self-sufficient, creative people, and they know how to handle unprogrammed time. So um, that, for me, is a lot harder. You know, I, I tend to be a very busy person, um, and that's how I feel healthy, and that's how I feel uh, productive, and that's what in some ways gives me meaning. And so this has been a shift in that kind of regard. But whenever, and, and I also think it's really important to acknowledge um, that, you know, there is anxiety involved with this process and that's totally okay. It's okay for us to feel anxious. It's good for us to acknowledge that, and just touch it and be like, wow, you know, I'm certainly encountering something I have not encountered before um, in terms of specifics. but. In my life, when I encounter something that's really, really hard, and I'm happy for it, um, as have we all, um, I really always try to zoom out and look at the 10,000 foot view, you know, to get that kind of, you know, I, I don't know what, to, you know, a bird's eye perspective or this kind of demigod perspective and zoom way out and look and say, hey, look, worst case scenario here, I mean, with, you know, without the worst case scenario of physical illness. But if we're locked down, if the world changes here, we are talking about 18 months, you know, two years. And it's like, by good graces, it's like, if I can stay healthy and more than anything, if I can keep my family healthy, if they can keep themselves healthy, the ones who are far away. Um, two years, it's like, it's going to change our perspective. But it's like, this is not our whole life. This is not a life sentence. We're going to move forward and that's the 10,000 foot. And then I can zoom out even a little bit more and go to 30,000 feet and say, wow, this is shaping our culture. We have an opportunity here. It's hard to talk about opportunities when you're down here on the ground and people are very sick and we're all afraid. But at yeah. 30,000 feet, you start to see the entirety of things. And they, oh, you know, 30,000 feet it takes a second to get there mentally. And then to, if, I, if it's possible, and I don't know if I've reached it yet with this one, but to zoom out even more and get to 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 feet, even an orbital view of this thing and really look at what's possible and really look at what is simply just happening by no choice of our own, but just for us to kind of surrender and say, hey, look, this is happening. We do have choices inside of these parameters and there's a silver lining here. You know what I mean? And we're trying to identify that and that in and of itself will take some time for each of us to metabolize mentally and spiritually. And um, I think it's a worthwhile cause and it's fun too, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it gets you away from the news and the social media and the this and the that, you know what I mean? It gets you back into a space that is productive. Um, I did that when I've had sick kids, I had sick, sick family members, I've done this exercise from time to time throughout my life when I've been broke, when I've been, you know, all these different things. And it's uh, to really zoom out and, and try to get outside of yourself and look at things from a much higher perspective 
um, call it spiritual, call it an intellectual exercise, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Um, I think it's actually really productive because again, what we have to do is set the rudder and aim the ship somewhere. Because if we're just out here drifting around, you know what I mean? It's gonna take a while to reach anything. But when we look at a spot in the horizon and say, I'm going there for better or for worse, <laughs> you know what I mean? And whatever you encounter along the way may change your point of reference, but at least you point it towards something. Uh, for me to get, to get that you know, way high up perspective um, is necessary. And, and also fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, thank you so much, dude. Everybody, this is Adam Russell. This is his painting back from 2005, which was gifted to me a long time ago. And now that I'm moving into a van, it is going to be cut up and displayed with pride. To display in front of thousands and thousands of miles and thousands of people. How cool is that? Yeah. And uh, so yeah, check him out. The Key West Pottery is his and Kelly's business. They are the pottery, oh well, sorry, let's, I'm gonna re-edit that one. They are the, your, they are your go-to pottery company for, or they're, I don't know why I just screwed that up. <laughs> anyways, anyways, yeah, Adam and Kelly both own Key West Pottery, so check them out online. You'll see the link in the description below. Thanks for hanging out with us. Remember, please, please subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna bother the crap out of you about it because I am only 800 likes to go before I can finally make some money off this channel because I am making zero dollars, everybody, and it's kind of scary. So all I ask you to do is subscribe. Three, two, one, do it now, and I'll see you tomorrow. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about this, uh, Afro? I mean, that is a what solid is piece of furniture. And, and that includes designing. A lot of design work. Look at our in my brain. I don't know what was going on. I'm digging it, dude. I'm totally digging it. Huh? I'm digging it. He's it out. Fart. They said, did you ease yourself? Oh, I totally did fart. Yeah. You got to go where they say, oh, you ease yourself. <laughs> and when somebody laughs, they ask, What's sweetie, man? <laughs> what, what's sweetie? Which is a good way. Something sweet you mix it up. And when you fart, you ease your body. <laughs> oh, God. It stinks, doesn't it? Cam like... Cameraman's got gas on him. <laughs> but see how much work I got done that work in the hot sun? I know, I, I, I figured the trick. So it's not, only, it's not only lunch, it's coffee and it's air conditioning. All right, give me a 15 second story. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't give you a whole story. It looks like saying it's a 15 second story. All right, all right, over and out. Over and out. The end of the day, time for my split. Cold cervation, cold cervation for real. That was an eight and a half hour job getting that thing done. Eight and a half hours. See, we're, I think this is working day number five, maybe four, something like that. Um, Afro has completely trashed my room. There is sand dust everywhere and he's going to leave me with a bunch of crap to have to deal with. After I fed him a tuna fish sandwich with low sodium, because his high blood pressure needs low sodium. The boy sure can check. <laughs> the boy sure can check. And he got his coffee, so he got his low sodium diet. He got his coffee, he got air conditioning. And in exchange, he's building me a really, really, really awesome and now you have to go so <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I tell you what, this guy's an absolute trip. I love it. Okay, that's it. And we'll see how it looks in just a few days. Actually, tomorrow looks like we're gonna be putting it in the van. And then I'm putting the van, let's see, putting the bed together, and then I'm doing all the wiring. I'll be ready to rock and roll.